All right, let's go to Luke chapter 22 this morning. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, this morning in this session, again, I went back and forth, of course, on what I believe the Lord would have me share with you. But I want to share something with you that I believe can help you right where you are as a young person and a teenager going into these transitional years of your life. And it's a term that we throw around often, but sometimes we really don't dig into it to have a good understanding of what it truly means and what it truly is. And that is the will of God. We tell you all to do the will of God, find the will of God. But do you really understand what the will of God is and how to discern the will of God? So in this session this morning, that's what we're going to talk about, how to understand what God's will is for your life. All right. Luke chapter 22. Let's begin reading in verse 39. The Bible says, and he came out and went as he want to the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at a place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity that we have to be here in your house this morning. And God, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for times like this where we can gather together to hear the teaching and the preaching of your word. God, we even thank you for times we can come together to sing songs that lift up your name. God, and even just to come together to have good fellowship, to laugh and just have a good time. And God, we thank you for the preparation that has gone into this meeting and uh, to the service this morning. God, we thank you for those who have labored behind the scenes and God those who are laboring this week as well we praise you for them God help us as we look into your word God help us to find some things that we can glean and apply to our life that would help us to be more like you God help us to have a better understanding of what your will is God I truly believe that you have a purpose a plan for each and every young person that is here this morning so God help us now as we look into it and we'll give you all the praise and honor for it in your name Jesus we do pray amen As we look into the gospel records, those first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we not only have a great opportunity to see some things that Jesus did, but we also have a great opportunity to see Jesus for who he truly is. Now, there are a lot of people today who will acknowledge that a man named Jesus existed. But when you start talking about Jesus for who he truly is, they back away from you. They will say that he was a man. But the moment that you say that he is God, they start to disagree with you. For example, Jesus asked Peter. He says, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter responded, well, some say Jeremiah or some say Elias or some say John the Baptist. And he stopped him and said, well, whom do you say that I am? And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So it's important for us to remember that when we're talking about Jesus, the son of God, he's more than just a man. He's more than just a teacher. He's more than just a prophet. When we start talking about Jesus, we have to always remember that he is God. John said it like this, and I said this verse already, but John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We say often that Jesus, he is a hundred percent God and he's a hundred percent man without ceasing to be God. So when we look into the gospel records, we're seeing Jesus for who he truly is. Now, when we talked about salvation Yesterday morning in the session went into a little bit deeper understanding about that. I told you that there were many types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Now, when we look at the tabernacle, there are so many types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in the tabernacle. Again, that tabernacle, just like the ark, it only had one door because there's only one way into the presence of Almighty God. You go through that door and you see that there's a uh, an altar there. and We're reminded that Jesus, he is our sacrifice. You see that there's a laver there. and We're reminded that Jesus, he cleanses us. We see that there are some golden candlesticks and it reminded that he is the light of the world. You see the table of showbread and you're reminded that he is the bread of life. There are so many different pictures and types of Christ in that tabernacle. Let me give you two of them that I really want to emphasize for you this morning. There is the gold in the tabernacle that represents his deity. And there is the wood in the tabernacle that represents his humanity. So the gold says that he is God and the wood says that he's a man. Now, one thing that is interesting about the gold in the tabernacle. Now, keep in mind that the tabernacle 
It was a temporary dwelling place for the presence of God. So they could pack up the tabernacle and move it from one location to another location. Here's the amazing thing. God commanded Aaron and his sons in that Levitical tribe that whenever you pack up the tabernacle, anything that is gold, this is what God said do. God said cover it up. So when the tabernacle was being moved from one location to the next location, you wouldn't look over and see any golden candlesticks. Everything that was gold and everything that represented the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, when that tabernacle was moved from one location to the next location, God said, cover it up. Listen to me closely now. This is exactly what happened when Jesus left heaven and came down to this earth. Listen now, he did not lose his deity. He did not stop being God. His deity was simply veiled or covered up. As it says in John chapter one and verse number 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So all of God's godness, all of Jesus deity, it was veiled and it was covered up in flesh. He didn't stop being God. He never lost his deity. As Philippians chapter two says, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, what we are witnessing is not Jesus losing his deity, but Jesus limiting the use of some of his heavenly attributes. So don't be confused when I tell you that Jesus, he is God. And I say that God is omnipresent, meaning that God is everywhere at the same time and the same degree. But yet it takes him four days to get to Lazarus to raise him again. Say, wait a minute, you just told me that Jesus was God. And you told me that God is omnipresent. Why is it taking him four days to get to his grave? He's limiting the use of some of his heavenly attributes. When I tell you that Jesus is God and I tell you that God is omniscient, that means God is all knowing. He knows everything, but he's going through a crowd of people. And there's a woman that gets down on the ground and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops and says, who touched me? He said, wait a minute, brother. You told me Jesus was God. You told me God was all knowing. Why is he asking questions? He's limiting the use of some of his heavenly attributes. Look, when you see Jesus there hanging on the cross, don't for one second think that the nails are holding him there. If he wanted to, he could have called down thousands of angels to get him off the cross. Look, the nails weren't holding him there. Love was holding him there. Don't think because he's on the cross, he's lost his power. He's still all God. But he's limiting the use of some of his heavenly attributes. When we look into the four gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we are seeing is that each man is writing to shed a certain light on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Matthew, this is why Matthew is writing. This is going to be important what we talk about in the Gospel of Luke, all right? Matthew is writing to prove to us that Jesus is the king. Mark is writing to prove to us that Christ is the servant. Luke is writing to prove to us that Christ is the son of man. And John is writing to prove to us that Christ is the son of God. This is why you see certain stories in certain Gospels. The birth of Jesus is only found in the Gospel according to Matthew and the Gospel according to Luke. Why? Because Matthew's writing to prove that he is king. A king is not voted in. A king is born in. And if you trace his lineage, it's traced all the way back to King David. Luke is writing to prove that he's a man. Well, in order to prove that he's a man, we got to show that he was born. Right? John is writing to prove that he's the son of God. We don't need to show that he was born because he's God's son. Mark is writing to prove that he's a servant. We don't need his birth. The servant's birth doesn't matter. So this is why you see certain stories in certain Gospels. It appears that Matthew is a contrast to Mark and Luke is a contrast to John. Because Matthew comes in and says, Christ is a king. And then Mark comes right behind him and says, he's a servant. Say, wait a minute, time out. Is he a king or is he a servant? Yes. Luke writes and says that he's the son of man. And John comes right behind him and said he's the son of God. Is he the son of man or is he the son of God? Yes. He's 100 percent man and he's 100 percent God without ceasing to be God. He's the God man. He's the king and he's a servant. He's the son of man and he's the son of God. They're all writing to shed a certain light on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we start talking about the will of God, when we're talking about that for our own life, this is what we're thinking of. Where do I go to school? What career should I take? Who should I marry? Is God calling me to preach? Is God calling me to the mission field? These are some of the things that we're thinking of when we're talking about the will of God. I want you to hear me clearly this morning. When we start talking about the will of God for Jesus, the will of God for Jesus was to die on the cross for the sins of mankind. He knew why he came and he submitted to that. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He submitted himself to his father's will. 
Every step that Jesus took was one step closer to the cross. Now, when we get to Luke chapter 22, it can be a very confusing passage of scripture if we're not careful. Because out of all the prophecies, out of all the types and out of all the pictures in the Old Testament, Jesus gets as close to the cross as he's ever been. And we have a chance under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to put our ears up to the Garden of Gethsemane and listen to Jesus pray. And listen to the prayer. We're as close to the cross as we've ever been. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The father's will is for him to die on the cross. Look, from the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. And we get as close to the cross as we've ever been. And he says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Let, let's make a couple of observations this morning. One, Jesus is not attempting to avoid the cross. He knew why his father sent him and he submitted to that. Even as a 12 year old boy, he said, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. He said, I do always those things that please my father. And here in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's saying, not my will, but thine be done. So he's not attempting to avoid the cross. What I believe that we are learning here in the Gospel of Luke. Someone tell me, why is Luke writing to prove that Jesus is what? Son of man. I believe that we are seeing Jesus submit himself to the will of God as a man. In his humanity, I believe we see Jesus submitting himself to the father's will. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus, the son of God, had to submit himself to the will of God, how much more do you and I have to submit ourselves to the will of God? You, you know what we really need in your generation right now? We need some young people who can echo this prayer that Jesus prayed. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Here's the question I want to ask you this morning. What are you going to do in your garden? What are you going to do in your garden? See, everyone at some point in time, they're going to pass through a garden. Say, Berlea, what, what do you mean we're going to go through a garden? In the garden of your life is where you choose between your way or God's way. Between your will or God's will, what, what you want or what God wants, all of us must go through a garden. And may God help us when we're going through our garden to be able to say, God, not my will, but thine to be done. Look, isn't it something that when we're getting to the end of the gospel records, it's all ending in a garden? Someone tell me, where did all this start? It all started in the garden. Look, in the garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose their own will and it brought condemnation to the world. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Father, Jesus chooses the Father's will and it brings redemption to the world. Look, I can tell you with no hesitation this morning, young people, that it is always best to choose God's will over your own. So let's look at this garden. I want you to understand that the garden is a place of pain and struggle. The garden is a place of pain and struggle. Look, sometimes we make it sound easy, don't we? We tell you, do the will of God. And then we say, have a good day. <laughs> Serve the Lord. Have a good day. But look now, in the garden of your life where you're choosing between your will and God's will, it's not an easy place to be. It's a place of pain and struggle. Look, I personally believe that Jesus, he almost died in the garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 22 that there appeared an angel unto him, strengthening him. The Bible tells us that he was in agony. Luke, being a physician, was the only one that recorded for us that he was sweating as it were great drops of blood. Matthew tells us that he was sorrowful and heavy. Jesus tells his disciples, I'm exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Hebrews tells us that the angels had to come and save him from death. Look now, when you're choosing between your will and God's will, it is not an easy place to be. I told a young person recently that I'm more concerned about you if you aren't struggling than if you are. You know why? Because the devil doesn't mess with anybody that's going in the same direction as him. But the moment you start trying to go opposite of the devil, then the resistance comes. We're, we're all stuck in this pool. Is it my way or is it God's way? Is it my will or is it God's will? Is it what God wants or is it what I want? It's not an easy place to be. The garden is a place of pain and struggle. Not only is it a place of pain and struggle, it should be a place of prayer and supplication. It always amazes me when we read through the gospel records, when we see things like this. Jesus prayed. And Jesus went into the mountain and prayed. He withdrew himself by the stone cast and prayed. He knelt down and prayed. Look, if Jesus had to pray, how much more do you and I have to pray? Look, 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 God, listen to me closely now. God is not hiding his will from you. It's not like God is saying, okay, here's, here's my will for Brother Ed. 
I'm going to hide this thing over here. And let's let Brother Ed spend 33 years of his life just searching for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to play hide and seek with my will. Look, God wants you to know what his will is for your life. There, there are some people that say, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, here's the question. Have you asked him? Have you prayed about it? He's not hiding it from you. Maybe you need to get down on your knees and pray and ask God to give you further direction on what he has for your life. Amen. Now, when we start talking about the will of God, I divide the will of God into two categories. There is God's general will and then there is God's specific will. Look, God's general will is something that is for everyone. And then God's specific will is something that is just for you. Listen to me closely. Do not get down on your knees and ask God what is just for you until you have already done what is for everyone. God exposes his will for your life as you do his will for your life. There are, look, we have it so easy. Look, when I was a kid, this is what I used to have to do. If I was trying to think of a verse, I would have to take my Bible and go to the back of my Bible and think of a key word that was in the verse. And I would have to go back to my my accordance and my concordance and I had to look down and find the key word and I would probably have to go through 12 verses before I found the one I was really looking for. Right. Look, y'all have it so easy today. No, not y'all. We have it so easy today because we can do this. We can take out our phones. We can go on our computers. We can get out our iPads and look now. You can just type in a word or a phrase that you thought was in the verse and look now. You are nowhere near it <laughs> and it pops up. <laughs> look, look, look. There are some things in the Bible where it clearly says this is the will of God. Yeah. Say, brother, Ed, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Listen to me. Pull out your phone, go on a computer, go on an iPad, go to a Bible app, type in the will of God. The first five verses that pop up do that. Yeah. Look, let me give them to you. Salvation is one that is the will of God for everyone. Right. The Bible says in first Peter, chapter three, second Peter, chapter three and verse number nine, for the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you're saying, brother, Ed, I want to know what God's will is for my life. I can tell you with no hesitation that it is God's will for you to be saved. Amen. It's God's will for you to know for sure that when you die, heaven is your home. Salvation is the will of God. Not only salvation, but transformation is the will of God. Amen. Romans chapter 12 and verse number two. The Bible says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, and listen to this, and perfect will of God. Say, brother, what is God's will for my life? Is God's will for you to be saved, and is God's will for you to allow him to change you? That's God's will. Salvation is the will of God. Transformation is the will of God. Sanctification is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3. It doesn't get more plain than this. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you abstain from fornication. You say, what do you mean by sanctification? God wants you to live a clean, a pure and a holy life. Amen. Say, brother, what is God's will for my life? God's will is for you to be saved. God's will is for you to be changed. And God's will is for you to be clean and holy. Right. Let me give you one more. Gratification is the will of God. And everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thessalonians 5:18. Look, so look, 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 this is God's will for your life to be saved, to be changed, to be pure and to be thankful. Amen. That's God's will. Now, until you do what God has shown is for everyone, don't ask God what is just for you. Listen, the will of God is something that is reserved for the child of God. Amen. This morning, I, I, I planned initially planned on preaching on living a life that is led by God. Living a life that is led by the spirit of God. When Abraham's servant said, I being in the way the Lord led me. Listen to me very closely. God does not lead with road maps. He leads with steps. Right. Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understandings. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. God does not show you the end from the beginning, but he will show you the next step. Say, brother, how do I know what the next step is? Show, take the step that he's already shown you. Yeah, and then he'll show you the next step. Look, how many how many of you young people drive legally? Look, somebody. Like, <laughs> right now, look, let, let, let's let's go to driving school for just a moment. If you get in the car at night, you put your seatbelt on, you're driving at night. What is one of the first things you should do? Make sure those lights are turned on. Right now, imagine somebody sitting in the car at night. Completely dark. 
They don't have their lights on and they're saying, I'm not moving anywhere until God lights up the street all the way to my house. Can you imagine that? No, your car doesn't work like that. Even when you turn the lights on, the streets don't light up all the way to your house. How do you get more light? You drive a little bit, then it gives you more light. You drive a little bit more, then it gives you more light. Look, this is how God leads. This is how God works. This is how God directs. You want to know what to do, then do what you know. Amen. And as you take that step, he'll show you the next one. So what I want to do, we're going to go quickly. Got your running shoes on, y'all? We're going to go quickly. We're going to look at some people in their garden. And we're going to see some people that went through a garden. And I want to see if you can find yourself in one of these people. All right. Let's go to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. Should we pick on the boys first or the girls? Boys. Well, I am a gentleman. Ladies first. The first person we're going to see in their garden is Miss Eve. Miss Eve. Let's look at Genesis chapter three and verse number one. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. We're looking at Eve in her garden. And notice the first thing that Eve is doing in her garden. She's conversing. She's conversing. Now, someone tell me, who is she conversing with? Who is she talking to? She's talking to the devil. She's talking to the devil. Listen to me very closely. You know why a lot of people and a lot of young people are struggling in their garden? They're having a conversation with somebody they have no business having a conversation with. Look, look, look listen to me very closely. Never give your ear to anyone that has not given their heart to God. When, when you're going through your garden and you're trying to choose between your will or God's will, what you want or what God wants, the last thing you need is somebody in your ear trying to convince you to do something that is contrary to God. Don't give your ear to anyone that has not given their heart to God. Eve is sitting here and she's having a conversation with the devil. And look now, while the devil is conversing with her, guess what he's also doing? He's challenging her. He's challenging her. Yea, hath God said... Look, this is why we keep talking to you about so much about memorizing scripture, learning the word of God, going deeper into God's word. Even Brother Kilpatrick is mentioning studying the word of God, not just reading the word of God. Look, you have to understand what God's word says. Let me tell you why. Because God's word will never contradict God's will. And God's will will never contradict God's word. If you're telling me that it is God's will for you to do something that is contrary to God's word, I can tell you it's not true. God's word and God's will always run hand in hand together. Yea, hath God said, you better know what God said. And then not only is he challenging her on the word of God, do you know God's word? But then he's going to start convincing her. Look at what he's convincing her of. Verse number three. But the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Look what the devil says. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He's convincing her. Look, he's convincing her that what God said is not true. Look, look, look. The Bible says knowledge, it puff it up. Look, it's not, it's, it's, it's good to know God's word, but it's best to believe it. Amen. You can quote the scriptures. You can sing the hymns without looking. Go ahead on with your bad self. Go ahead. But here, here, here's the big question. Do you really believe all this stuff you've been quoting and singing? He said, ye shall not surely die. He's convers they're conversing. He's convincing. And now Eve gets curious. Look at what happens to Eve. He says, for God doth know in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Now, I don't want to re-preach a message I preached yesterday about battling temptations. But let me say this about the devil. The devil has no new tricks. He only uses the same old tricks on new people. No new tricks. This is what the devil is trying to trap Eve with. Here it is now. Same thing he's going to try to get you with. God's trying to keep something from you. God, God, God's trying to keep something from you. 
Some of you are sitting here right now and you feel like somebody in authority is trying to keep something from you. You just want to have fun. You just want to enjoy yourself. You just want to live your life and have a good time. Somebody's trying to keep something from you. Well, let me just tell you, we're going to tell you a secret at Youth Congress. All right. Are you all ready for it? They are. If you ever feel like that somebody in authority is trying to keep something from you, let me just tell you, let me pop your bubble for a second. They really are. Now, for those of you who know the early part of Genesis, God created the world. He stepped back and said it is very what? Good. The devil says in the days you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, knowing what? Good and evil. Wait a minute. We already know everything that's good. God showed us that. So what did the devil only have for them? Evil. God was trying to keep something from them. It was evil. Look, never access something that someone in authority has told you is off limits. Eve, she gets curious. The next verse, verse number six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, Eve, why are you looking at something that God said was off limits? She's getting curious. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Do you see the progression here? See, we love to say things like this. I can't believe that person fell into sin. As if that person was walking Minding their own business one day, tripped and stumbled, and oops, I landed in sin. <laughs> look, look, sin is progressive. Look, she saw, she took, she ate, she gave. Starts real small, then it gets out of control. You can't control your sin. You're right. Yeah. Started small, then it gets out of hand. And even when we go back to talking about the temptation, she encompassed every category in which sin could fall under the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. The lust of the eyes. It's all right there in verse number six. She's getting curious. Eve. Now let's talk about Adam. Fellas, your turn. All right. Adam. Adam was a man that was controlled. He was a man that was controlled. Now we'll speed it up here in just a moment. All right. I want to tell you how I thought the story went. Then I want to tell you how the story actually went. I used to think that Eve is over here. Let's just say this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. I used to think Eve is over here and she's taking this apple and the Bible doesn't even say it was an apple. You say, well, I thought it was a banana. Stop lying. You thought it was an apple. All right. So I'm thinking Eve is over here at this tree and she's taking this fruit and she's eating other fruit and she goes back. She gets dinner for her husband and brings it to Adam, who's over here, nowhere to be found and, and gives it to her husband. And this man just thinks he's eating dinner like he's eaten many times before. And he eats and then boom, sin came into the world. I thought that's how it went. Then I read the Bible. Look at the verse. Verse number six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband. What's the next two words with her? With her. And he did eat. Oh, man. Come on, Adam. <laughs> Come on, fellas. Fellas, I, I tried to get us off the hook. Think, picture, picture the scene. Eve is over there talking to a serpent. And what is Adam doing? He's sitting here right there the whole time. Watching her have this conversation. With him. Says nothing. Look, look, you know, Adam says that girl, have we seen any animals in this garden talk before? <laughs> and now all of a sudden you Dr. Doolittle now, huh? He should have said, leave that alone. Come over here. God said we can't eat of it. Neither shall we touch it lest we die. Come over here, girl. Don't. And by the way, God told Adam That's right. the yep. commandment. But Adam, he was controlled. Listen to me very closely. Sometimes one person's silence can be just as bad as another person speaking. I remember when I was working with a group of young people before. And how many of you fellas are in middle school? All right, I'm going to pick on y'all for just a moment. All right, somebody held their hand up real high. Okay, you might change your mind after I tell you this. All right. <laughs> now, when I tell this story, I just want y'all to remember that I used to be a middle school boy, okay? So I know what I'm talking about on this topic. Middle school boys are weird. <laughs> They're weird. They're going through an interesting phase of life, all right? <laughs> they can be a little strange. Now, now look, look, look. Sometimes middle school boys would do some dumb things. And look, it's not a problem when they do dumb things. Here's the problem when they don't know it's dumb. 
Now we got a big problem. When you do something dumb and you don't know it's dumb, now you a dumb dumb, right? <laughs> we got a big problem. So sometimes when you're working with middle school boys, you don't really have to hammer down on them all the time. You know, drop the hammer on them. No sense in dropping the sledgehammer on an ant. It's no big deal, all right? But sometimes you got to talk to a middle school boy and just make sure that this boy knows what he did was dumb. <laughs> I ain't going to beat you down. I just want to make sure you know that was dumb. Right? <laughs> so it was a group of middle school boys, and they did something that was just dumb. And I called these boys in, and I just wanted to make sure y'all fellas know what y'all did was dumb, right? Before I could even say anything, the boy comes in the office. Middle school boy, this is what he said. But Brother Eddie, I ain't did nothing. <laughs> I didn't even say anything. He said, but I ain't did nothing. He said, they was doing this, and they was doing this, but I ain't did nothing. He just kept saying, I ain't did nothing. <laughs> and I stopped him and I said, that's the problem. Everybody was doing wrong. Everyone was somewhere they should not have been doing something that they should not have been doing. And you sat there and you ain't did nothing. Some of you sitting here right now and you got that I ain't did nothing syndrome. Well, the world is doing this and my friends are doing that and these people are doing that. But I'm a goody two shoe. I ain't did nothing. Maybe that's a part of the problem. Sometimes one person's silence can be just as bad as another person speaking. Maybe every now and then you ought to speak up for righteousness. Adam was a man that was controlled. Listen to me, young people. Don't be a young person that is controlled in your generation. Look now where you're just going with the flow. You're just doing what everybody else is doing. You're just following the crowd because Adam was not only controlled, he was confronted. When God came in the garden, he didn't say, Eve, where art thou? He said, Adam, where art thou? And let me say something to you, young men. You ought to be the leaders in your youth group. You, 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 you ought to be leaders in ministry, leaders in church, leaders on soul winning, leaders in, in, in areas of service, because you're going to be men in church one day and you better learn how to lead now. God's going to hold you accountable for leadership one day. Adam was a man that was controlled. He was a man that was confronted. Eve was conversing and she got curious. Let's look back at the disciples. Picture this scene. Jesus says, I want you to come with me, fellas, and pray. Jesus goes as far to say, I'm exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. I want you to pray with me. Can you imagine Jesus coming to you and asking you to pray with him and to pray for him? What did the disciples end up doing? They fell asleep. Whoa. Like some of y'all about to do. Where my pen at? <laughs> right? I told you I'm going to throw something. Right? No. I got bad aim. I'll hit a baby. I can't even try. <laughs> well, that's a bad visual, isn't it? <laughs> but they're, they're complacent. The disciples are complacent in this moment. Jesus says, come and pray with me. And these boys, three times, they fall asleep. Three times. Look, we are, we are seeing this rampant right now. I'm telling you, we're seeing this rampant, not just with teenagers, not just with young adults, but adults and period and people, period, people in general. We're seeing a, a level of complacency that is just crazy right now. I'm talking about where people have no burden and no vigor and no desire, no energy to do anything for the Lord. Some even anything in life, period. I, I run into some young people and every time I see them, it looks like they just woke up. They just, yeah. Uh-huh. Amen. What is going on? No energy, no desire, no vigor, nothing. <laughs> and then you, you, you ask them, say, what do you, what do you believe the Lord wants you to do with your life? I don't know. Do you, do you believe the Lord's calling you to pray? Yeah. Where, where, where do you believe God wants you to go to, go to, go to school at? Yeah. That wasn't a yes or no question. Wake up. But there are some people who just mope and just go through life. Uh, just complacent. Listen to me. God has a plan for your life. Amen. God has a purpose for your life. God has a will for your life. God wants to use you. That's something that ought to excite you. Snap out of it and wake up for God. Amen. They're complacent. Just going through the motions. They got chastised. Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Got chastised. Look, look, look. This is what we need. This is what we need. Let me just tell you what the example is. The example is not Eve. The example is not Adam. The example is not the disciples. Here's the example. Our example is Christ. Well, what was Christ? He was perfectly content. 
He's perfectly content. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Listen, God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. God has a will for your life. But you have to get to the point in your life where you're content with what the Father has for you. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Look, I want you all to listen to me now. Only in the Christian life can a person surrender and win. Think about that. Only in the Christian life can a person surrender and win. I told you all basketball is my favorite sport to play. If a team gets up by 40 and 50 or 50 at halftime and they say, you know what? We don't even want to come out of the locker room. This game is over. They surrendered and they lose. If a man is in a boxing match and he's getting beat up real bad and the corner says he can't take it anymore, he takes a white towel and he throws it in the ring. They surrender and they lose. If you're in a war and the army is overpowering you and you wave the white flag, you just surrendered and you lost. But listen to me, only in the Christian life can you come to God and say, I surrender, and he gives you the victory. There's no better life to live than one that is surrendered to the will of God. May God help us as believers to where we can get to the point in our life where we can all say, not my will, but thine be done. I truly believe God's going to call some of you young men to preach. Would you say not my will, but thine be done? God's going to call some of you to the mission field. As we had a young lady that surrendered, I believe it was last night. Can you say not my will, but thine be done? God's going to call some of you to serve in full time Christian service. Can you say not my will, but thine be done? Let me just remind you, when you surrender to him, you lose nothing. Amen. But you gain everything. It's always best to choose the will of God. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve said, I'm going to take my own will. Brought condemnation to the world. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm sure I'm glad that our Savior said, not my will, but thine be done. He chose the Father's will, and it brought redemption to the world. It's always best to choose the will of God. May you get to the point in your life where you can also say, not my will, but thine be done.